So today we are going to look at unit three, strings and dimensional, one dimensional arrays. First, we need to have a conversation in our first lesson about primitives and class types. We've actually dealt with both primitives and class types before. Today, we're gonna start with um, a class so the primitive is able to hold one piece of data. So some examples that we've looked at are ints and doubles. We could have a variable called a, and it could be storing the number 17. And we call this a Java primitive data type. In memory, it's literally just holding the number 17, and we have this variable a, and it's acting like a tag. The class data type holds more than just one piece of information. The variable holds a reference to that information somewhere in memory. And it's acting like a tag, and that tag is only holding the reference. And then in the memory location is all of the data. Uh, it can hold different data types. It has built-in methods. Users can create their own classes. A good example of this is the string class, which we're gonna do a little bit with today. So users can create their own uh, classes as well, and you can build your own methods and have that information there for you to use in the future to complete more complex tasks in an easier way. Let's look at how variables are actually stored in memory. For primitive data types, when we declare int, we're telling the computer to set up a memory space that is big enough to hold any possible integer that we can write. And it's assigning num1, the variable tag, to that memory location. And in that memory location is the number 17. A class data type doesn't do that. A class data type stores just the memory location, the reference, so for example, the word one is storing the reference to the string literal hello somewhere in memory. The class data type is referring to the information in memory. One of the things that we'll find out is that strings behave a little bit differently than other class data types. That information gets stored in what we call a reference table, which affects a little bit about how, we behave, how they behave as normal class objects. But for our purposes, we're gonna treat every class object as the same, except for the strings. We'll talk a little bit about that. And on the AP exam, they're not gonna ask you any questions that have to do with this weird kind of string table that Java uses, because it's specific to Java when they talk about class data types and the things that you need to know about class data types. So one of the things we can do with class types is create what's called an alias. And the way this works is pretty simple. Suppose we have two variables, the string a, which is pointing to the string literal what, which is in memory location 10, and then the string b pointing to something else. And then in the next line of code, we have string B is assigned A. Now that doesn't mean a copy is made. What means, what happens here is that string, is that B gets the reference to the memory location. So they're both pointing to that same memory location with the word what. So they're both have the number 10 stored to them, for example. And if I change A, then I'm also going to change B. And again, this is true for all classes. 
The string table, there's a little bit of difference there, but we'll talk about that later. I keep promising we'll talk about it. We will. But for in general, for any class, if you change A, then you also will change B. They're connected because they're pointing to the same thing. It's like having a Christmas present and having the package with two different tags on it. And whoever gets that little Cindy Lou Who present um, will end up having uh, two tags on it, and they won't know who the, the tag, um, the gift belongs to. So let's take a look specifically at strings and comparing strings. If I have two strings, string A set up to string literal happy and string B set up to string literal happy, and then I wanted to compare them, you might think that if A is equal equal to B, that would execute as true because they both have the word happy in them. However, a doesn't actually store the word happy. And B doesn't actually store the word happy. It's storing the reference to the word happy. And B is storing the reference to the word happy. So A may be storing the number 10. And B may be storing the number 11. So if we're comparing 10 to 11, they're not the same. So this would execute as false. Now, there are a special case for strings. We can compare a string to a string literal, which you've probably done, and it works. But that's only because of the way Java stores strings. For any other object, it will not work. This equals equals idea for objects does not work, and it is not the correct way to compare objects. There is another way to do it, that will work. Before we go on to the next slide, I want to look again at our aliases. Suppose I set A equal to B. In other words, I assigned A the value of B. If I did that, the happy that's in box 11 would no longer have a tag on it. It would go away. It'd be garbage. And B would now get 10 stored in the box. So A and B, if I did an equals equals for A and B, that would evaluate as true because they both have exactly the same reference. So this A equals equals B in this case would be true because they're both pointing to the same object, the same reference. And poor box 11, that's thrown out and becomes garbage. And it really is a real thing. Java has a garbage collector that comes in and grabs anything that doesn't have a reference to it and throws it out. Let's talk about what happens when we set up a class object or an instance is really a better word there. And we don't put anything in it. So if we look at this string word, we're not actually storing anything in string. We're just setting up in memory. And what we say is it has a null reference. That's N-U-L-L, -L, null. And it means no reference to anything in memory. All we did is set up space somewhere in memory to hold a string. And we talked about before sizes of strings are variable dependent upon the number of characters in them and there's some kind of math formula to figure it out. But none of that's really important. The computer handles all that for you. All you need to know is that the word null means nothing has been created yet for the string word. But a space in memory has been set aside for that string to exist. And that's a no reference or a null reference. If we were to use that and say we created string alpha, the final frontier, and then we assign alpha null, what happens is the string, the final frontier, gets garbage collected. Java comes in and gets rid of any objects that don't have a reference to them. So if we have this object that is floating around in memory and has no tag on it, no alpha tag, 
then it gets thrown away. And Java does that constantly. It's constantly collecting the garbage. So if we look at this, this is what it would look like in code. If we had string alpha and we set it equal to the final frontier, and then we assign beta to alpha, which is setting up an alias. So now beta and alpha are pointing to the same thing in memory. And then we assign alpha to null. What will happen in memory? Well, what happens is that the tag that is on the final frontier is alpha. And then we're adding another tag called beta. And then finally, we're getting rid of the beta tag, excuse me, the alpha tag, and all that's left is on the beta tag. So it's not, it didn't lose its reference, it's still there. The equals equals test, just to review, only compares the references. It's not store, it's not comparing the actual values that are stored. So if I say A equals equals B, then it's checking what is the name of the reference location. And in this case, they're not the same. But there's a special case for string tables, so sometimes equals equals works with strings. It's not going to work with any of the object, and you don't have to worry about that on the AP exam. The AP exam will not ask you a question that's confusing about the string table. So we just treat it all objects the same. That equals equals does not work when we're checking to see what the values of the objects are. There are two different memory locations, so if we did A equals equals B in this case, it would evaluate as false because there are two separate memory locations. There's one last thing we need to talk about in this lesson, not because it's related to objects, but because it is related to us being able to use the next set of objects we're going to look at, the next class. And it has something called a for loop. A for loop allows you to count for a specific number of items. So 4j equals 0 to 2 would count 0, 1, and 2. Because j is less than or equal to 2 is the test. So we're going to keep going until j is less than or equal to 2. The j++ tells us how much to increment each time. So we're going to go 0, plus plus is 1, plus plus is 2, and then at 3 we would stop. So we're going to print out i and j for 0, 1, and 2. And we'll get those three values printed to the screen. A for loop is really, really useful, and we're going to look at it a lot when we start looking at the next set of objects, which are arrays. And that is a very useful object. And we'll make a lot of these kind of alias ideas and equals comparisons a lot clearer. One last thing, if you are looking to compare objects and strings, and we'll look at this in the next section as well, dot equals is the method we would use to compare them. So I would say the name of the string, my string, dot equals, put in parentheses the thing I want to compare it to, and that would let me know whether or not it is equal. So that's all for today. I will see you next time.